Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, my name is Edwin Schaubel. I'm the chair of the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all um, to our uh, 2021 uh, virtual uh, commencement celebration. Um, <clears throat> so uh, on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students, I'd like to welcome all of you. Um, and uh, especially, of course, I'd like to welcome our graduates and award winners for this year. We're honored to be able to join with all of you today, um, especially our graduates, families, and their loved ones. Um, and we, we're so happy to be able to celebrate you, even if we have to do so from a distance. We hope that we'll be able to get in, together in person soon. Um, so uh, stay tuned. <laughs> we'll try to make sure that you know when we're able to do that. Um, we're looking forward to it. Uh, very much. To our graduates, um, please know how proud we are of you for your achievements, for your perseverance, and your dedication through a year in which the need for safety during COVID all too often made it necessary to improvise or delay classwork and research um, laboratory, in the classroom, in the laboratory, and in the field. Through all of this, please know that it has been our great joy to help you get to this day. On behalf of all of us, I would like to say, congratulations, class of 2021. Second, to the parents, guardians, and loved ones of our graduates, congratulations to you too. Um, you did it as well. I know that our graduates recognize and honor all the support that you have given them, especially through this difficult year. We recognize and honor that support. So that's the most important thing I have to say today, um, but I would like to say a bit more about today's program and about our department at UCLA. The highlights of our schedule today include hearing from our guest speaker, Jessica, Dr. Jessica Watkins, as well as from our valedictorians, followed by the presentation of our graduate and undergraduate degree candidates. Then we'll present our undergraduate awards and that completes the formal program. But after that program is complete, um, well, we've uh, Dr. Watkins has agreed to stick around to uh, uh, participate in a question and answer session that will be moderated by Professor An Yen. And after that question and answer session, then we'll open up some smaller breakout rooms that you're encouraged to visit and even jump back and forth between to interact with your friends and family. Now, before we move on to um, Dr. Dr. Watkins' talk, I'd like to talk a bit about what we do in the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. Our mission is to understand and protect our home in the universe. We pursue that mission through research, teaching, service, and outreach. Our research encompasses the properties and history of our home planet, Earth, and including its natural hazards, such as earthquakes, magnetic storms, and pollution. We also study our sun, other planets, and smaller bodies in our solar system, and even planets around other stars. Over the past year, this has led to new discoveries on the influence of topographic stress on the size of landslides, which could be really important for protecting people against future uh, landslide hazards. Um, and we've also uh, seen discoveries uh, and the most precise measurements yet of the uh, length of the day on planet Venus and how it changes over time, which tells a really interesting story about how the planet is coupled to its own atmosphere. In addition to their outstanding research, our students take the lead in bringing science to the public through school visits and events such as Exploring Our Universe, which is usually offered live on the UCLA campus each fall, but this year had to be made into a virtual event through a Herculean effort led by graduate students in the sciences, and in particular led by several graduate students in our own department. As we look forward to the reopening of UCLA and of California and the United States and the world, I wanna emphasize our gratitude to all of our graduates and award winners for your determination and your adaptability in completing your classes and theses 
during the coronavirus epidemic. Even though access to labs and field areas was restricted or in some cases just simply impossible, and work had to be done while isolated in many cases from friends and advisors and other sources of support, your grit and your love for learning have been amazing to witness. You set an example for achievement through adversity. Thank you. Our guest speaker will be Jessica Watkins, and she'll give the next presentation on today's program. Dr. Watkins will be introduced by EPSS Professor Anyan. Okay, so let me uh, share my screen first. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, so let's see. Oops. Somehow I cannot open the full screen. I don't know why. Uh, let's see. Okay, so can everyone see me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jessica Watkins uh, for uh, our commencement uh, uh, invited speaker. Uh, Jessica, uh, known to her classmates and me as a Jess, uh, graduated from a Stanford uh, University uh, with a bachelor degree. She was a member of the Stanford NCAA Rugby Championship team, uh, Division One, <laughs> and uh, also a member of the US national rugby team while she was uh, uh, undergraduate student at Stanford and she has been competing. Uh, she was competing internationally while she was uh, uh, with the US national team. She started at UCLA uh, in 2011 with a dream to become astronaut. So, we, so, so her dream was well known in her office and uh, it's uh, also a, a part of our um, amusement because her uh, uh, office mates constantly worry about her uh, diet uh, food when she was on six month journey to uh, Mars. Uh, that's uh, her passion. She can't stop talking about Mars all the time. While she was uh, at UCLA, she was also uh, 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 working at a JPL as an uh, intern, uh, working on the WISE project, uh, locating, uh, categorizing uh, 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 small bodies uh, in the solar system. And, and uh, also she received an NSF graduate student fellowship. Um, she got her master's degree in 2013, and uh, I was very pleased. <laughs> she decided to further her career to, uh, um, to pursue her PhD, and she success successfully completed her PhD in 2016 uh, on a, a spectacular project on Mars, of course. And uh, right at the uh, time that she uh, graduated, she got uh, two different offers. Uh, she could be famous either way. So she was uh, uh, offered with uh, this uh, prestigious uh, Caltech uh, postdoc uh, doctoral fellowship. At the same time, she was invited in 2016 uh, uh, to uh, uh, participate in uh, a training camp for the uh, 2016 Rio Summer Olympic uh, game because she's a, a world-class athlete. She was agonizing and uh, we discussed many times uh, and then she eventually decided instead of to be a famous uh, Olympic uh, uh, athlete, uh, that was the first year uh, the uh, rugby was uh, 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 incorporated into uh, Olympic as a formal form of sport. So while she was at uh, Caltech, she was uh, a, a participating scientist for Mars Science Laboratory um, working next to the person who drives the vehicle and uh, direct where to go to see geology. And uh, 2017, she was uh, selected as a NASA astronaut candidate. And after uh, two years of intense training, she's now a formal astronaut. Uh, she participated in NASA's uh, NEMO mission 23. So my understanding, NEMO 
mission is that it's a simulation of uh, extreme space environment. Basically, you live, you do things just like you're in space. So that was a quite, uh, uh, I assume, quite a fun kind of a, a, a thing, a unique uh, uh, experience. And she's currently the member of the Optimus team with the uh, aim of returning humans to, uh, um, uh, to the moon uh, in the near future. So <laughs> you may wonder how could Jessica accomplish so much in uh, you know, such a short time? I was wondering, but uh, if you know Jessica well, the secret is quite obvious. Jessica was literally eating nothing but a powered by Mountain Dew. So her office was scattered with the Mountain Dew uh, with open and opened uh, uh, a cap. So uh, since I can't really offer her any drink right now, so I'm offering five bottles of a virtual Mountain Dew for Jessica so that she can uh, she can uh, uh, go through this uh, speech. So welcome Jess back home and uh, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much, An, for that <clears throat> for that introduction. And I definitely will take you up on those five bottles. I'll I'll be coming back for those. <laughs> but um, in all seriousness, thank you, An, for everything um, that you did to help get me here and for your continued support throughout the years. It means a lot to me. Thank you, Dr. Sho, for having me. And good afternoon to the faculty, families, and friends and of course, our distinguished graduates. Congratulations. It is a huge honor to be able to speak with you today on your, your graduation day. It's crazy to think that just six years ago, I was sitting right where you are. Okay, maybe not exactly right where you are uh, since most of you are, are at your, your homes right now, but you know what I mean. Uh, obviously, quite a bit has changed about my life since then. Uh, but I have to tell you, the one change that I still haven't recovered from is the lack of Diddy Reese ice cream sandwiches on demand. I, I haven't gotten over it. You guys, you don't know how good you have it. <laughs> I do think, though, that it does warrant pointing out that my journey from where you are to where I am now uh, has been relatively short. And I think that's a testament to the preparation I received and the experience I gained while at UCLA in this department. And I hope that this serves as evidence to you that you can dream big and realize the goals you set for yourself. As graduates of the UCLA Department of Earth, Planetary and Space Sciences, you are world-class scientists and scholars capable of trailblazing innovation, groundbreaking discovery, and literally saving the planet. But as graduates of the UCLA Department of Earth, Planetary and Space Sciences in 2021, you're even more than that. You are world-class scientists and scholars who are also resilient, resourceful, and resolute. And that rare combination makes you capable of both saving the planet and changing the world. You are resilient. I promise I won't read you the definition of each of these adjectives, but this one struck me. Resilient, returning to the original form or position after being bent, compressed, or stretched. Let me start by saying no one would fault you if you are feeling bent, compressed, or stretched after the year you've just been through. But you continue to show up when it would have been so much easier not to. You took, you took it one day at a time, or if you're at all like me, one pair of sweatpants at a time, and didn't let challenges stand in the way of your goals. You overcame social isolation, civil unrest, chronic stress and anxiety, financial uncertainty, loneliness, loss, even boredom, without letting it discourage or at least define you. You embody the spirit of the Perseverance Mars rover, which launched last July and landed on Mars in February in the midst of a global pandemic. 
It's worth noting, however, that the Perseverance, but that Perseverance was selected as the name for the rover in early 2020, before we knew what the next 18 months would bring, before we knew how apt it would be. It was chosen because perseverance and resilience are qualities that are vital to success, even in a pandemic free world, like the one you're about to enter. Turns out resilience is actually a recurring theme at NASA. Despite many setbacks and hurdles during the past decade, NASA has successfully launched 13 humans to the International Space Station since last March, including the first flight of a new vehicle and safely returned them home. It is tradition for the first crew of a new vehicle to name the capsule. And shortly before the SpaceX Crew-1 mission, the crew revealed the call sign they had decided on for their capsule. You guessed it, resilience. Certainly a timely statement that connects all of us here on Earth, but also a reminder that unprecedented success requires unprecedented resilience. You are resourceful. As Dr. Schovel mentioned at the beginning, you adapted to your circumstances and learned to use all kinds of virtual platforms to accomplish your work. Zoom, Teams, Google Meet, WebEx, Netflix Party, you name it. I heard some of you even resorted to doing field work in your backyard, which on the one hand makes me question the integrity of your samples a little bit, but mostly I'm just impressed. And perhaps most importantly, I'm willing to bet that you learn to lean on each other. More than likely, you're not celebrating success today in a vacuum, no pun intended, but with the understanding that you didn't get here all on your own, that this was a collective endeavor. The reason I'm so confident of this, of course, is because it has been profoundly true in my own experience. In fact, this was a lesson I relearned over and over during our two years of astronaut candidate training that An mentioned. There are five main aspects of this training, flying the T-38 jet, extravehicular activity training, so spacewalk training, uh, International Space Station systems, robotics, and the Russian language, plus other supplementary training, including survival skills, leadership training, and even a few weeks of geoscience training, my favorite couple of weeks. Luckily, we go through this broad range of training with our selection class, which for us includes 11 Americans and two Canadians who all come in with vastly different backgrounds and expertise. We have aerospace engineers, pilots, medical doctors, a combustion scientist, a submariner, a biologist, and even a geologist. But what was amazing and truly powerful about that diversity was that we were able to rely on different classmates' knowledge and skill sets during different aspects of training to help build each other up and ensure the success of the team. We relied on the pilots for help with learning to fly, on the rock climbers for help with rappelling in the canyon lands, and the Navy SEAL for help with the swim test. His advice to me, by the way, for the underwater swim portion was to close my eyes and go somewhere else. And that's, that's when I knew that we were bred a little bit differently. But that kind of teamwork, choosing to focus on what unites us over what divides us and choosing empathy over indifference is the key to the resourcefulness required to achieve the impossible. You are resolute. You wouldn't be here today if you hadn't set a goal, put in the work, and remained diligent and disciplined in your pursuit of it. You believed in yourself, even when others didn't, and found the motivation to go the extra mile, both figuratively on papers and projects, and literally in the field. But perhaps your path to this moment hasn't been a straight line. It certainly wasn't for me. I came into my undergraduate program as a mechanical engineering major. 
under the incorrect assumption that it was one of few options that would allow me to keep the door open to apply to be an astronaut in the future. But after two years of coursework, I determined it wasn't for me. I didn't enjoy it and nor honestly was I all that good at it. So I was at a crossroads where I had to decide whether to continue pursuing something I didn't love in order to follow a vision I had set out for myself or find something I did love and take the risk of seeing where it led me. I started searching through the course bulletin and found classes called what makes a habitable planet and planetary materials and was sold. I signed up for my first geology class the next day. I think Steve Jobs said it best. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. I encourage each of you to find your passion and pursue it relentlessly. And don't be afraid to explore different pathways to reach your dreams. So where do you go from here with your rare combination of world-class scientist who is also resilient, resourceful, and resolute? I can tell you sincerely, the answer is anywhere you want, with two caveats. We often get asked, how do you become an astronaut? And my favorite answer is, you apply. The only way to ensure you don't get the job, any job, is to not apply. So that's the first caveat. To go wherever you want, you have to apply. And then, uh, as, you, as Dr. Schobel mentioned earlier in, uh, earlier in the program today, the mission of the department from which you're graduating today is to understand and protect our home in the universe. And as EPSS graduates, it is now your responsibility to serve others by taking this mission with you. Many of you are doing this already, as Dr. Schobel mentioned, but that's the second caveat. When you go wherever you want, you have a responsibility to serve others. As one example of where the degree you're about to receive could take you, I'll end with a shameless plug for some exciting work we're doing at NASA. The Artemis program, which Ann mentioned, will send humans back to the moon in a sustainable way and eventually onto Mars and relies on the work of numerous EPSSers, past and present. We are building off of our understanding of the Apollo samples analyzed in this department planning landing sites and traverses using maps of lunar water ice developed within this department, and applying fundamental principles of geologic fieldwork taught in this department. The first Artemis mission will be an uncrewed flight, hopefully later this year, which will be and will be followed by the Artemis II crewed test flight and the Artemis III lunar surface mission. But you can absolutely bet that it's going to require world-class scientists and scholars, and maybe some engineers, who are resilient, resourceful, and resolute to get us there. Regardless, no matter what you choose to do with your degree, don't ever forget that you're capable of saving the planet and changing the world. Congratulations to the class of 2021. And I look forward to answering any questions that you have uh, later in our Q&A session. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much, Jessica. That was wonderful. So um, coming up next in our program, we have uh, presentations from our uh, two valedictorians. Um, <clears throat> that includes uh, Christopher Takahiro Lambert and Valeria Villa. Um, I believe Christopher will give the first presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm first going to try to share my screen in this moment.
All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay, well, I just wanna say thank you again to our guest speaker. Uh, it's certainly a daunting task um, to have to speak right after an astronaut, but I'll give it my best. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity to share some thoughts and reflections I had um, over the course of my last four years of undergrad education. Um, oddly enough, like Jessica Watkins, uh, I was also uh, a mechanical engineer when I first came into school. And uh, after two years, I guess I came to the same conclusion. And so here I am. Um, and I couldn't have uh, made a better decision. I'm very happy that uh, I chose to study geology. Uh, it's been quite the ride. Um, so I thought I would share some takeaways um, from my, my education. So number one, as you might guess, uh, I've developed an, an obsession with rocks. Um, used to not have this obsession, but uh, certainly studying geology will give it to you. Um, picture on the right was taken at Death Valley uh, just about a month ago. Um, and I can tell you that my camera roll on my phone is, is now full of uh, pictures like this with uh, me posing um, with all sorts of cool rocks that I find. And um, I'll tell you that th this only happens with the rocks that, that aren't cool enough to actually take home with me. As my roommate can attest, um, uh, throughout the year, I have grown my rock collection and now there are boxes full of rocks uh, everywhere in our, in our small studio. Um, so uh, I, I was actually really proud that uh, the rocks I brought back with me from Death Valley uh, were, as my roommate said, the coolest that I've ever gotten. He said, uh, all the other ones are kind of boring, but these ones are, are actually kind of neat. Um, so if I can get a non-geology major interested in rocks, um, nothing makes me happier. But as we all know, geology is more than just rocks. Uh, it's uh, everything that encompasses the earth. Um, and so another thing that my geology education has given me is a deep appreciation for the natural world. Uh, so on the right here, this is me um, uh, with not just any rock, but El Capitan in Yosemite, perhaps uh, one of the most famous uh, rocks in the world or rock structures in the world. Um, I was taught uh, in mineralogy that you can do this uh, taste test to uh, try to identify certain minerals. Um, and although I wasn't able to make any uh, conclusions based on this taste test, I can tell you that it was uh, uh, pretty fun to, to connect with the rock in this way. Um, I think that when you go to somewhere like Yosemite, uh, most everybody can appreciate the magnitude and scale of the geology that's uh, taken place there. And it's hard really not to appreciate something as breathtaking as that. But what studying geology has given me is the ability to appreciate things that I once would have walked by and never really batted an eye at. Um, so for example, uh, one of our first field experiences as uh, geology undergraduates is to do this mapping exercise in Rainbow Basin, which is a couple hours north of LA. And I remember remarking to my instructor, Kevin Coffey, that um, had I not been a geology major, I probably would have passed through this area, kind of nodded my head and said, oh yeah, that was cool, and not really thought much about it. But while we were there, we spent five days out in the field mapping Rainbow Basin. And in those five days, uh, I felt so incredibly grateful to be out there um, exploring and mapping. I felt like part detective, part scientist. Um, and it was one of those things where I felt like I was being able to appreciate and analyze uh, a great masterpiece by a famous artist or a famous musician. There was just so many uh, different components to, to what was happening in Rainbow Basin that um, you know, the closest thing that it felt like was, was really art to me. Um, and uh, I, I've really grown to appreciate what mother nature can do and some of the really neat processes that happen on this earth uh, and elsewhere in the solar system. And so my last takeaway is um, all the fond memories of epic adventures. Um, over here, uh, this is a picture of us in Death Valley. Uh, just recently, uh, despite COVID, we were able to get on the field. Um, and I'm really grateful that I had that opportunity to have one last field experience. Um, 
it was actually kind of funny how I found out about this. Uh, we get these emails from the department and uh, I'm sure my classmates can attest, we get so many emails that um, it's easy to kind of overlook the important ones. Um, some of the stranger emails I've gotten in my time here is uh, uh, Dr. Edwin Schobel um, getting hacked multiple times. Uh, that seems to be a recurrence. Um, I, I'm always updated when the, the power outages happen in the geology building. Um, and also I always know when there's a distilled water shortage. So um, constantly updated on the state of the building. But uh, every once in a while you get a, you get a neat opportunity sent out in one of these emails. And so uh, Dr. Mackenzie Day uh, needed some help uh, setting up a research project in Death Valley. And I was lucky enough to get to go. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, although COVID sort of interrupted the amount of field experience that uh, my class got to experience. Um, I think that studying geology has given me the, the tools to run my own trips. And so that's kind of what I was able to do this year uh, to visit Yosemite, to visit the Grand Canyon. Um, and it was really cool to be able to see um, the things that I had studied in class uh, actually happen out in nature and uh, to be able to read some of those uh, signs that the National Park Service puts up and be able to nod my head and say, hey, like I actually know what they're talking about. Um, very grateful that my education was able to do that for me. Uh, so what's next? Um, unlike many of my classmates who are uh, going off to industry or continuing on in academia, um, I'll be off to fly in the Navy. And I wouldn't think that really relates to geology. Um, God forbid if my ship ever runs aground, maybe I can tell them what rock we hit. Uh, but kidding aside, um, I do think that there is at least one significant connection between geology and flying. And as I mentioned earlier, it has to do with the appreciation of the landscape below me. And flying really gives you a one of a kind uh, bird's eye view of everything. And to be able to say that, hey, I actually kind of know uh, how this mountain range formed, or I kind of know uh, why the landscape looks the way it does or how it formed and what sorts of mechanisms were at play here is really rewarding. And so I'm very excited um, to, to move on to the next step in my life, but to also um, stop and reflect and uh, be grateful um, for what I chose to study in my undergraduate career. I just want to wrap up by saying thank you, uh, first and foremost, to my friends and family that supported me um, throughout my college journey, and then to all the uh, wonderful professors that we have in this department. Uh, I struggled through lower div classes uh, with professors that I felt were more um, invested in maybe research than in, in teaching. But as soon as I came to this department, I was blown away by um, how caring and understanding and knowledgeable uh, all the teachers were and uh, how invested they were in both teaching and research, and that's a hard balance to strike. I also want to say, say thank you to all my classmates. Um, it was so much fun getting to spend late nights in the geology commons or in the structural geology lab, um, and to be able to go out on the few field trips that we were able to do. Um, you guys were a fun bunch. I'm very happy I got to know you all. And I wrote counselors, but really there, there's only one counselor for uh, undergrads in EPSS, and that's Lori. And so I want to say thank you to her uh, for allowing me to uh, make this major switch uh, from engineering to geology. Again, one of the best decisions I've ever made. All right, that wraps up my presentation. Um, thank you again, everybody. Thanks so much, Christopher. That was great. Our next valedictorian is Valeria Villa. Hello, everyone. On behalf of our of my fellow graduates, I want to first thank you for joining us on this special day of celebration. And to my fellow graduating peers, congratulations. All the hard work and dedication that brought you here today, and you should be proud of this accomplishment. Now to our current graduating class, students and alumni, I want you to think back to when you first started UCLA into your first quarter. 
I know many of us had a different expectation of what we had and we all had a unique experience. As a transfer student, I had a, I had a slightly different, or more as individualistic expectation of what my time here was going to be like. Because I was coming from a community college, my norm was to drive to class, attend class, study, and then go back home. And because of this, at UCLA, I thought I was just going to simply walk to the geology building, attend class, study, and go back to my dorm. However, my perspective changed during the first few weeks as I realized how much the department had to offer its students apart from just attending classes. The first thing that changed my perception was the geology building. I recall once a faculty member of the department jokingly asked me if I was patrolling the building because he would often see me on different floors and at different times of the day. While I was not patrolling the building, I was in fact spending most of my time at UCLA in the geology building. I would routinely arrive at 8 a.m. and leave around nighttime and would even go on most weekends. You might be asking why would someone spend so much time in one building? And my answer is because of what this building embodies. It's a place for everyone to work and exchange ideas together, to step out of the world for a moment and enter your world of imagination and scientific pursuit. It's a place where you can take classes of your interests, be mentored by, ex by experts in your field through research projects, and go with adventures with many of your friends through the field camp courses, and so many other wonderful experiences that you wouldn't have experienced anywhere else. Also, the level of care I witnessed from the department, from the custodial to staff to faculty, is something that I believe exists nowhere else, and that is why students here feel welcome and at home. When UCLA went into the remote setting, most of us were very saddened to leave the building. I was especially saddened to leave what felt like home. However, it was by being away from the physical building that gave me an insight into why this was such a magical place to begin with. During the remote experience, I started to attend the seminars and colloquiums, which gave me a further insight into the department outside of the class settings. I also witnessed the professors struggling to convert the courses to favor the remote learning and the staff working night and day to ensure a smooth running of the administrative and IT side. It was in these moments of struggle that we observed their resilience, strength, innovation, and most importantly, the care for the department and their students. These were one of the many positive qualities I witnessed, and I plan to employ them as I move forward. While I was not physically present in the geology building during the 2020-2021 year, my continued involvement in programs, research classes, projects, organizations, and study groups made it feel like I was there. That's when it dawned upon me that it was us who made the geology building a magical place. It was our late night study groups that filled the classrooms and the common room. It was us who were inspired by the cool rocks and posters in the hallways. It was us who converted scientific ideas in seminars, classrooms, and in the hallways as we passed by. And it was us who were, learned, who, who were mentored by the experts in our field. And it was us who gave life to the building. The building nurtured the environment of many scholars before us that have now gone out to explore their own scientific pursuits and personal goals. And today, we are one of them. As a final thought going forward, I'd like to leave you with the Bruin modified phrase from the Captain Marvel movie that I kept in mind during my time at UCLA. And it goes like this. As a Bruin, we go higher, further, and faster. Thank you. Thanks very much, Valeria. So thanks to both of our outstanding valedictorians and uh, for their wonderful um, memories of uh, UCLA. Um, next in our uh, program, we have the presentation of the graduate degree candidates by uh, our uh, graduate advisor, Professor Abby Kavner. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great, good. So good to see people's faces. 
So my first job is to read off the names of the Masters of Science candidates in the department. Congratulations to all of the recipients of Masters of Science. Zhi Yuan Bao in Geophysics and Space Physics. Jordan Bretzfelder in Geology. Justin Takashihiga in Geology. Leslie Insixiang Mei in Geology. Valeria Guadalupe Jaramillo Hernandez in Geology. Jiawei Lu in Geochemistry. William Kennedy Meissner in Geophysics and Space Physics. Ashley Marie Schoenfeld in Geophysics and Space Physics. Francisco Eduardo Spalding Astudillo in Geophysics and Space Physics. Colin William Wilkins in Geophysics and Space Physics. And David Yasevich in Geochemistry. Congratulations to all of our recipients of the Masters of Science in their respective fields. Next, I would love to present the PhD recipients and I'll give their name, their major, the name of their advisor and the title of their dissertation. Lydia Alexandra Adair for a PhD in geophysics and space physics with an advisor, Vasilis Angelopoulos. And the dissertation title is The Effectiveness of EMIC Wave Driven Relativistic Electron Pitch Angle Scattering in Outer Radiation Belt Depletion. Congratulations. Congratulations to Alexandra Elise Doyle for a PhD in geochemistry with advisor, Professor Edward Young. The dissertation title is Analysis of Polluted White Dwarf Stars with Applications to the Geochemistry of Rocky Exoplanets. Our next PhD recipient is Richard Allen Hart with a PhD in Geophysics and Space Physics with advisor, Professor Christopher Russell. And the title of the dissertation is Statistical Study of Lightning Generated Whistler Mode Waves Observed by the Venus Express. Our next PhD recipient is Jamie Karen Lucarelli with a PhD in geochemistry, working with advisor, Professor Aradna Tripathi. The dissertation title is Low Temperature Geochemical Proxy Systematics and Applications from Paired Clumped Isotopes, Cap Delta 47 and Cap Delta 48, to Elemental Ratios in Carbonates. The next PhD recipient is Jeffrey Thomas Osterhout with a PhD in Geology and advisor, Professor J. William Schultz. The title of his dissertation is Studies of Precambrian Microfossils and the Search for Ancient Biosignatures on Earth and Mars. The next PhD recipient is Krista Lynn Sierra Sachuk, and her PhD is in Geochemistry with advisor Professor Abby Kavner. And the title of Krista's dissertation is High Pressure Behavior and Chemical Reactions of volatile bearing minerals in, in Earth's mantle. Congratulations. And finally, congratulations to PhD recipient Xu Zhang for PhD in geophysics and space physics, working with Professor Vasilis Angelopoulos. And the dissertation title is Electron Driven Instabilities Around Dipolarizing Flux Bundles in Earth's magneto tail. Congratulations to all of our graduate students. Thanks, Abby. Yes, congratulations to all of you. That was great. Um, so uh, next we have the presentation of our uh, baccalaureate degree candidates by our undergraduate advisor, Jonathan Arno, Professor Jonathan Arno. Thanks, Edwin. 
It's always a pleasure and an honor to get to read out this list of names on such a huge day where people take such a momentous and massive step that is so well-earned and hard-earned. So it's a pleasure. Congratulations, everyone. First, I'll be reading out the names of students who received minors in our department. Kyle Warren Davis with his major in astrophysics, minor in geophysics and planetary physics. Kevin Kenpo Ang, major chemical engineering, minor in geology. Thomas Michael Mancinelli, major in chemical engineering, minor in geophysics and planetary physics. Jackie Panero, major in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, minor in geochemistry. Venezia Ramirez, major in environmental science, minor in earth and environmental science. Riley Thomas Russell, major in psychobiology, minor in earth and environmental science. Giselle Sains, major in environmental science, minor in earth and environmental science. Hazel Huang Ki Shan, major in biochemistry, minor in geochemistry. Kirtana Valuri, major in environmental science, minor in earth and environmental science. Christy Zhao, major in psychobiology, minor in earth and environmental science. Let's thank, let's, let's send our congratulations to everyone with a minor from earth and planetary and space sciences. Okay, great. Next, we will do students who received a Bachelor of Arts degree. Jacob Alexander Hoffman, Earth and Environmental Science, Bachelor of Arts. Jocelyn Reyes, Earth and Environmental Science BA and Biology BS. Golda Sharath, Earth and Environmental Science, Bachelor of Arts. Alondra Ureña, Bachelor of Arts in Earth and Environmental Science. And Chase Eliza Miranda Wheeler, Bachelor of Arts in Earth and Environmental Science. Let's congratulate all our Bachelor of Arts degree awardees. Great. Okay, now for our Bachelor of Science degree awardees. Faisal Sami Almagluth, Bachelor of Science in Geophysics. Amelia Claire Campos, Bachelor of Science in Geophysics. Juliana Zulema Katibo. Bachelor of Science in Geophysics, as well as uh, a minor in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. Norma Angelica Contreras, Bachelor of Science in Geophysics. Claire Elizabeth Devola, Bachelor of Science in Geology. Fiona Hernet Grant, Bachelor of Science in Geology with a minor in History. Albino Guatemala, Bachelor of Science in Engineering Geology, minor in Chicana and Chicano Studies. Jennifer Vanessa Guzman, Bachelor of Science in Geology. Amanda Rauliza Gilalas Hunt, Bachelor of Science in Geology with a minor in Geochemistry. Christopher Takahiro Lambert, Bachelor of Science in Geology with a minor in Geophysics and Planetary Physics. 
Alexis Light, Bachelor of Science in Geology. Maynard Mickey Roberts Maganini, Bachelor of Science in Geology with a minor in Geophysics and Planetary Physics. Monica Eliza Mendoza, Bachelor of Science in Geology. Abdullah Hasith Bin Mod Lokman, Bachelor of Science in Geology. Nabila Nizam, Bachelor of Science in Geology with a minor in Environmental Systems and Society. Abraham Joseph Okaili. Mazirik, Bachelor of Science in Geology with a minor in Environmental Engineering. Alexa Terrazas, Bachelor of Science in Geology. Diana Jean Erda, Bachelor of Science in Geology. Valeria Villa, Bachelor of Science in geophysics. Jade Carrillo White, Bachelor of Science in Geophysics. And Simone Yeager, Bachelor of Science in Geology. I'd like everyone to, to congratulate everyone who is awarded their bachelor's degree today. Again, such pride on all of our parts, on all of your behalves. It's such a pleasure to get to do this. You guys all just rocked it. Congratulations. Thanks, John, and thanks to all of our undergraduate uh, degree recipients. So next we have the presentation of undergraduate awards and that, that those presentations will be given by our vice chair, uh, David Page. <laughs> Dave, are you there? He's he's in the participant list. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I needed to get unmuted. <laughs> All right, uh, as uh, vice chair of the department, it's my pleasure uh, to announce the undergraduate awards. Um, these awards are made possible by our generous donors to the department, uh, which include uh, alums, so keep that in mind, guys, as well as uh, former faculty and friends. So uh, already mentioned, but I'll do it again. Our co-validatorian award recipients are Christopher Takahiro Lambert and Valeria Villa. Thank you very much for your wonderful valedictory speeches. We also have a set of co-salutatarian award recipients. And these include the Diane Obers Lenz Scholarship the uh, recipients are Claire Elizabeth Devola, Amanda Rosalia Gulalis Hunt, Nabila Nazim, Alexa Terrazas, and Jade Carrillo White. Then for the J. Douglas and Patricia Traxler Scholarship, the awardees are Fiona Hernet Grant and Abraham Joseph Okeli Mazarek. Finally, we have a set of Summer Field Award recipients. Not finally, second to finally. Uh, these are students who will have an opportunity this summer to actually go out into the field. Uh, we're very happy to say that we are resuming our in-person instruction this year in Summerfield. 
And all these students will have an opportunity to go out with uh, Professor Onion uh, in the field. And I can tell you as a disciple of Professor Yin myself, you guys are about to receive a, uh, a, a, a training in geology that is unparalleled anywhere in the solar system. So uh, you guys are very lucky indeed. So we have a set of different scholarships and awardees. Uh, there's the Clarence A. Hall Jr. Summer Field Award, which is going to Maynard Mickey Roberts Magani, Mag Mag Maganini, excuse me, and to Abraham Joseph O'Kaley Mazarek. Then there is the Walter S. Harris Summer Field Award. Uh, the recipients are Abel Joseph Aragon, Joshua Anthony Lee, Erwin Wilfredo Matamoros. We also have the Clem Nelson Summer Field Award. This is Sky Alexander Grimm and then Quinlan Raymond Parker. And then there's the Dean Oberst Len Summer Field Awards. These go to Alana Grace Archibald, Morgan Alexandria Carrington, Fiona Hernet Grant, Jennifer Vanessa Guzman, Teresa Megan Wang, Reba Kakaria, excuse me, Camille Lynn Pierce, Jeanette Carr Rolf, and Rachel Elise Tripoli. And finally, we have a set of undergraduate research award recipients. These are awards uh, given to students who submitted their own proposals for original research projects and selected by a, uh, a, a faculty uh, review panel. There is the Dean Oberst Len Undergraduate Research Award, which is Alanda Grace Archibald, Riva Kakaria, Alexis Light, and Alexa Terrazas. We also have the Harold and Mela Solwood Undergraduate Research Award going to Arthur Wan Ki Lo and Abel Joseph Aragon. And then finally, the John W. West Fund for Undergraduate Research Award goes to Jonathan Quinn Sakrisen. So let's give a, a, a warm ovation for all of our undergraduate uh, award recipients. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, and thanks, of course, to all of our uh, degree recipients and our degree candidates and to all the award winners for an uh, excellent job and amazing achievement. Um, so uh, in addition to congratulating all of the all of our graduates and award winners, um, I just want to mention that the, to, to finish out today's program, we're going to have uh, a question and answer session with our uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Jessica Watkins. Um, that's going to be moderated by Professor Anyan. Um, and uh, to, uh, to uh, submit questions, we're going to do that through the chat. Um, Rod, I don't know if there's a particular place that those questions should be placed in the chat or if people should just ask questions to the everyone um, address in the chat. But uh, uh, he'll <clears throat> give you that information and then I'll, I'll uh, hand it over to An for the, for the question and answer. Yeah, I think we can just send it to everyone. Um, I hope that the question is not, yeah, not a secretive. <laughs> and then I will uh, paraphrase and uh, send it over uh, to Jess. Makes sense. Okay. Go ahead. Great. So um, this is a great moment that you can, uh, um, you know, consult with uh, someone who actually went through, had all the battle scars, went through everything that you experienced as Jess mentioned. And you can ask uh, her past experience and also her current uh, work and uh, future aspirations. So questions, welcome, anyone. 
Okay, maybe I can start uh, just to give you a little warm up. So, uh, so Jessica, so uh, how did you uh, balance your time between uh, study and being a world class athlete at uh, Stanford? Uh, I know that this, you know, both are so demanding, particularly as an undergrad. You take so many courses. It seems like just by taking courses already overwhelmed. Then you're competing. You're traveling away from school, sometimes away from a country and all that. Um, so maybe you can just uh, give a, a, you know, a few words about how you balance your life. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking on. Um, yes, you know, I think that actually is um, a really important set of skills that I, I learned over time, um, being able to balance kind of an academic or professional load with um, the, you know, the, the demands of, of being on an, an athletic team. Um, and I think what I gained from that, that I really take forward with me now, even though I'm, you know, no longer com competing um, at that level, um, but is really just the discipline to um, really kind of, you know, use every, every minute intentionally. Um, and whether that is using that time, you know, to, to, to study or to, you know, get work done, or also to spend that time doing something that is important for you as a, as a whole human. Um, I think either way, being intentional about choosing to do that is really important. And I think, you know, no matter what uh, we end up doing and no matter where we end up going, I think it's really important to continue to have uh, passions and interests outside of work, outside of your you know, professional job um, that allow you to be um, kind of a well-rounded and whole person. And I think that will feed back into your, your work. It will enable you to be, um, you know, more productive during the time that you do spend uh, doing, getting your work done. So I think both are actually, um, they, they help serve each other in that sense that it, it creates a, a more structured and, and disciplined environment whereby every minute kind of counts. Um, and so as a result of that, you really kind of learn to make the most out of, of every situation that you're in. Yeah, I can testify that I, uh, I found that Jess uh, being an, an athlete, she is really probably the most disciplined uh, graduate student I ever had. She was really treating her study and her schedule like an athlete. So that's an incredible skill from, uh, from someone who went through this intense uh, time management for two very, very demanding tasks. Uh, I have a question um, from one of the graduate students who also wants to become astronaut. So the question is, uh, which one of your extracurricular activities do you think has been the most helpful, useful advantages to your journey to, being, uh, to become a, an astronaut? From a hopeful future astronaut. <laughs> all right, I, I look forward to your application, first of all, um, and come join us. Um, but, you know, so I would actually say that what your extracurriculars are doesn't matter quite as much as just having them. So having something else that you are pouring yourself into and, and spending time doing um, that just, you know, uses different parts of your brain, uses different parts of your body, you know, just um, something else that you're doing outside of your work that creates, you know, this well-rounded person. And also, you know, a lot of that um, kind of team skills that we get out of some of those extracurricular activities. Um, obviously, for me, you know, doing sports, there's, you know, pretty, pretty obvious teamwork component to that. Um, but, you know, just that that kind of social um, interaction, learning to kind of play well with others um, is a really important part of this job and really any job that you end up doing. So I would say that, you know, find something that you really enjoy, you know, certainly don't do anything. Uh, professionally or personally, because you feel like it is what you should be doing, or because it's you know what what some other astronaut did. You know, do what you really love to do, and that will that will shine through all the way up through the top. Uh, I will also add, sorry, um, the the one extracurricular I would recommend is uh, internships. So um, I'm super instrumental in helping me um, get an internships at JPL, uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab, while I was at UCLA. Um, I also did a couple of internships at NASA Ames while I was an, an undergraduate. Um, and those types of experiences um, just really enable you to kind of um, apply a lot of the more kind of academic side of things in kind of a more um, industry and 
um, you know, mission focused kind of way. Um, and that really opened, opened doors for me, created opportunities and ultimately helped me decide what it was that I wanted to do uh, with my future. So certainly be on the lookout for um, any kind of internship opportunity you can get. Okay, so we have a, a question from a, a curious uh, faculty member, uh, Jonathan. How long is the uh, Artemis uh, program? And uh, how long can an as astronaut remain within, uh, within the program? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, that's a good question. The Artemis program is, um, you know, I, I don't know that we have lined up kind of out how far we really will go. It really is going to depend a lot on, you know, how, uh, you know, when the rubber hits the road, kind of, you know, where the funding is coming from and how long um, we're able to sustain that funding. But certainly the intent um, behind the mission is to um, create this sustainable, you know, sustained and sustainable presence on the moon. So the, the idea is to set up a base camp and um, on the surface, but then to also have the gateway, the lunar gateway in orbit around the moon um, as kind of an orbital, orbital platform not dissimilar from the uh, International Space Station, a little bit smaller. Um, but the idea is to, you know, kind of create um, this, this whole uh, base camp and infrastructure that will be long lasting. And then we'll eventually will serve as the platform uh, to kind of enable technologies and um, uh, infrastructure uh, to and, and engineering even to get us to Mars. So I, I can't give you a date. Uh, but I hope that the answer is a very long time. And the second half of your question, I hope, is also a very long time um, <laughs> that, that, that astronauts could remain in the program um, as long as they are, essentially, as long as we stay physically fit, really. Um, that, that's kind of the main um, thing that, that drives uh, and, and interest as well. But um, that's kind of the main thing that, that, that drives any end, num end number on age in the program. Well, that warm-up question will basically stir the, uh, inspire too many questions. So the, the next question is from uh, uh, our departmental manager, the one who actually keeps the department running, um, uh, Carleen uh, Brown. Uh, her question is, uh, what was the most challenging part of your astronaut training? Yeah, you know, so I think that the, the, the real problem, the, probably the real answer to this question is the most challenging aspect is really not any one particular aspect, but just the, the, the breadth of, of aspects that it includes. So, you know, kind of on any given day during this, this training period, you know, you could wake up one day and have, you know, a, a check ride in a, um, you know, in a T-38 jet. And then the next day, you know, you're um, in the suit, you know, in the, the, the giant puffy um, spacesuit doing training underwater to learn how to do spacewalks. And then the next day you gotta switch your brain again and go into Russian language mode. Uh, so just kind of the, you know, um, the amount of, of knowledge um, that we, you know, have to know, especially coming from an academic background where, um, and a, you know, PhD in particular, where the, you know, the name of the game is really to be um, you know, a, a world expert on a very, very narrow, um, you know, slice of the universe. Um, and this, you know, coming, coming here is really kind of the opposite is um, knowing just enough about a lot of different things. So making that transition uh, into more of the kind of operational role that, that we serve here uh, was, was definitely a bit of a learning curve for me. Thank you. So the next question from uh, our department's uh, IT czar, uh, Rod. Uh, O'Connor, and his question is, uh, what is or uh, was the most unexpected or surprising part of your journey to becoming an astronaut? <laughs> well, the, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the potentially obvious answer to that question was um, that it ended with becoming an astronaut. <laughs> um, you know, I think um, this is always, as, as Ann has mentioned, you know, has always been a dream of mine and certainly something that I um, you know, intended to kind of keep the door open for at least, you know, I didn't want to uh, close myself off from that possibility. But um, I think the honest truth is that I, I never fully envisioned it, it kind of actually happening and um, certainly not um, with, with my first application. So I, I, I say it, um, you know, not, not to be trite, but, but in, in all truth, um, you know, kind of that, that the, end, the journey has ended up here is, is surprising to me almost every day still. 
That's amazing. Um, I know we just feel blessed that when we have something that uh, the dream finally uh, <laughs> uh, got fulfilled. That is amazing uh, uh, part of a life. Um, uh, next question is from Professor Silky Moo. Um, she probably started after uh, Jess graduated, but she's also working on Mars and Moon uh, with our colleagues. And uh, her question, she's thinking about very, very far down the road of a geological future. And she's, she, her question is, so what is your future plan after astronaut? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> I, I don't even know what I'm doing next week. But um, <laughs> I, yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the kind of moon to Mars program that NASA is kind of embarking on with the Artemis program and the intent to, um, you know, to, to try to use the moon as a stepping stone for Mars. And I certainly would love to be a part of that process in, in some form or fashion, whether it's at NASA or at an academic institution. Um, I certainly, you know, that is, is always going to be my first love and I uh, would love to participate in that in, in whatever way I possibly can. So we'll see, we'll see what that ends up looking like, but uh, it's definitely very exciting. I was just, uh, I was just reminded uh, uh, that I missed one question uh, uh, from uh, Mark uh, Bresfelder. Uh, Felder, yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you'd have made sure to cover in graduate school if you knew you would end up where you are now. Interesting. <laughs> what huh. we forgot teaching you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, you're not setting me up for success here. <laughs> uh, absolutely nothing. I, everything I was taught was perfect. Um, no, I, 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 you know, I can't think of any, any gaps in training or anything like that, but I will say that certainly um, one thing that has really served me well even thus far, and we'll only continue to do so even more as we go towards the moon, um, is all of the field work training that I was able to do um, with on and with others um, in the department. That um, kind of operational experience that, you know, getting out and getting your hands on um, kind of training has been um, absolutely crucial to, you know, my ability to kind of um, learn how to do that in a, you know, in a microgravity environment and then uh, hopefully on a, a lunar surface environment as well. We have a quite a we have a quite a few students who are inspired to become astronauts. So that's another astronaut uh, hopeful. Awesome, <laughs> um, awesome. A graduate student of uh, Professor Dave Page, uh, Elisa uh, Jati. Uh, her question is: Do you think your experience with the planetary analog missions helped with your astronaut application, especially MDR uh, M MDRS? from mm -hmm. another hopeful astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, to, the short answer to your question is absolutely. Um, I think the, um, so the planetary analog, um, she's mentioning the Mars Desert Research Station um, was a planetary analog in Utah um, that I participated in in undergraduate. Um, and um, yes, I certainly think that all of those um, kinds of experiences um, were really super helpful to provide a context um, for, you know, what we're really, what we end up really doing when we're, we're going to space is, you know, living in a small space about the size of a, the length of a school bus with, you know, five to 10 other humans. And, you know, and those are the only humans that you get interaction with, don't get to go outside, right? Um, and so getting prepared for that type of environment, both from a, a professional, you know, um, you know, how do you how do you work and operate in that environment, but also from a personal one, how do you, um, you know, what do those social interactions look like and, and how do you build each other up as a team. Um, those kinds of experiences are where you'll start to build those those types of skill sets, which are absolutely crucial to what we do. Uh, so that desert um, MDRS was was one example. Another is um, desert rats, um, which I think they're actually starting back up um, desert rat stands for desert oh boy, research and technology studies, I think. Um, and that is um, an analog experience where we have um, people out in the field in Arizona, um, you know, doing geology. And there's a science back room, a science team that sits in mission control in Houston, here in Houston. And the idea there is to help 
uh, start to understand what are those you know, communication structures and team structures that we'll need when we go to the moon in order to have those conversations where we are you know, getting input from the experts, you guys, um, and that that's being fed to the crew member on the surface so that, they're be, so that they're able to make good decisions about what samples to collect and where to go next. Um, but it is, you know, especially with the time delay, for example, you know, that kind of communication is not necessarily straightforward. So those kinds of uh, platforms to start to study those types of questions and start to, to uh, find what is actually going to work is really important. Great. So next question is from an uh, undergraduate student uh, who uh, is going to go to UCLA. And her question is, what made you choose UCLA for your PhD? Um, the student's name is Alexa Teresa. Yeah, excellent. Um, I'm glad to hear that uh, you've chosen UCLA. You've made the right choice. Um, <laughs> I Yeah, there are several factors that went into helping me decide on UCLA. Um, it certainly was the, the best choice for me. Um, one was the opportunity to, to work with Dr. Yin and to be able to um, study Mars, but also in particular to come from um, a, a perspective of applying you know, fundamental geologic principles that we understand from Earth and being able to apply those to Mars. And so using Earth as our kind of laboratory to be able to investigate Mars. And then we end up kind of doing vice versa as well. We learn about Earth in the process of studying Mars as well. So that, that kind of comparative uh, planetology, uh, if you will, was super exciting and interesting to me. Um, and then I, I also um, certainly one um, benefit to UCLA to me was also its proximity to um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, I knew that um, I was interested in, in working on NASA missions and so being close by to that um, ultimately did enable me to, to get uh, some experience and internship opportunities there. So that was um, a really, really great combination for me. Great. So uh, that's quite questions from Lori, <laughs> we all know. Uh, when we, we will learn if you are selected to launch an Atmos mission, if selected, do you prefer to stay with the lunar mission science as a senior expert, would you rather pursue the opportunity to travel to Mars? So you have a two presentation choice. Yeah, uh, those Which are, those are big questions. Right. Um, yes, so I'll start from the, the second question, which is that um, I would, you know, I would love to be in a position where I'm, cho I'm choosing between those two scenarios. Um, that would be that would be amazing. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even know that I could could answer that question, but I definitely would be uh, just super excited about the opportunity to to go anywhere, to go to the International Space Station, to go to the moon, you know, and then and then to help us to get to Mars would be amazing. Um, the, um, the kind of mission assignments for Artemis um, will probably um, be coming in the next uh, year or two. Um, so we'll, we'll see what ends up happening with that. But as we mentioned, you know, the Artemis program um, should be you know, persisting for a long time. So hopefully uh, I can get in there at some point. Great. So we have uh, uh, Christopher Lambert uh, who asked the question of, uh, it sounds like you've had to make some tough decisions in your life like choosing between the Olympics and the Caltech. What is your approach to this big life-changing decisions? Yeah, um, how much time do you have? <laughs> no, <laughs> um, it, is, it is certainly not simple. And it, it also is certainly not lost on me, you know, the kind of um, embarrassment of riches type of um, situation that, you know, like you described, where, where I'm choosing between two pretty, pretty awesome opportunities. Um, you know, for me, you know, that one in, in particular, that decision, you know, I, um, I certainly relied a lot on, on mentors and family and friends to provide their input in terms of um, what they thought would be best, what they thought would be best for me in particular, you know, knowing and understanding my, my goals and priorities. Um, and that's really what it comes down to is really just kind of setting, setting priorities for yourself and then building you know, making decisions around those as opposed to vice versa, right? It is it's easy for your decisions to set your priorities. And that's that's a, a, a backwards approach that, that can get you in a, in a spot that you don't want to be in. So um, certainly not easy, but um, something that um, has, has, luckily it's all worked out. <laughs> so next question is from a, a little girl. Um, 
she uh, uh, had a very fuzzy memory of Jessica, but Jessica probably still remember her. That's my own daughter, oh, yes. <laughs> Hannah Ian. And yes. uh, so Hannah, okay. uh, so I do have a story that it when uh, I took Hannah to HU, and Hannah was a very curious, very interesting the space and plan of her research. And NASA set up those video stuff so you can just walk in to, uh, to listen and watch. So mm -hmm. when uh, my wife Sandy took Hannah when she was maybe three or something, and there was one person sitting there watching the, you know, all those fantastic movies. Guess who that was? That was Jessica. <laughs> that just shows how much a passion Jessica had. I mean, just that she does not lost that curiosity, you know, even as a, like something for kids. Anyway, so my my daughter Hannah's question is, uh, Jessica, what were what were the tests that you had to go through to become astronaut? <laughs> Ah, good question, and I hope I hope all is well with the, your whole family. Um, um, uh, yes, so our the kind of selection process um, involves um, first the first step, um, as I kind of mentioned in, in my talk, was is really just to apply. Um, there's an online application on you know USA Jobs, just like you apply to do anything else in the government. Uh, you just kind of send in your resume. Then from there, um, they kind of narrow it down, um, ask for references, and then there are a couple of rounds of uh, in-person interviews. And um, during those kind of a few days to a week of interviews, um, one really large component of that is medical testing. Uh, so they are just you know, making sure that there isn't anything that's gonna crop up while you know, you're up on station with limited you know, access to resources um, that's gonna be an issue. So they're you know, just looking for for anything that um, you, you may or may not be aware of um, that's going on with your body. Um, and then um, a, a kind of a second uh, piece of it is um, a bit of, you, know, you could call it uh, psychological testing, but it really is more kind of, um, you know, an assessment of your um, team skills and leadership um, capability. So we do just kind of some exercises with the other um, interviewees that are there with you. Um, and they just kind of observe, you know, how you interact with others. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, once they kind of, once you kind of get to the point where they bring you in for an interview, you know, at that point, your, your resume is kind of, uh, kind of irrelevant, you know, it has already, you know, spoken for itself. At that point, what they're really looking for is just to see, you know, who is somebody that people enjoy spending time with, you know, that, that won't get they won't get annoyed with when you know they're up on that school bus, you know, with six other people. Um, that's that's really ultimately um, what it ends up coming down to. Great. Um, so we'll have a, the next question uh, from an undergraduate or oh, graduating undergraduate student. Uh, the question is, uh, why has it been so long uh, for uh, for NASA to return to the moon? Uh, just a yeah, human yeah. to return to the moon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it is, it is a really good uh, question. It's a, then it's kind of a depends on, on who you talk to a little bit. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, NASA has, has focused in the past, um, you know, sub, past few decades um, on our presence in low Earth orbit. And so um, we actually have been in low Earth orbit on the, you know, kind of manning the International Space Station for 20 years now, um, which is a, a pretty amazing feat that at, at, at every single you know, second, 24 seven of the past 20 years, we've had some, at least one American or um, USOS um, person in orbit around the earth kind of looking down on us. Um, so that's, that's pretty incredible. But obviously, you know, resources are, are not endless and um, have limitations to them. And so, you know, with that focus that has meant um, that we were you know, not able to focus on the moon in the same way. Um, there are obviously you know, uh, political uh, persuasions that play into you know, who th that kind of decision making, again, way above my pay grade. Um, but it is super exciting now to be able to continue with our um, ISS work use, with our, the help of our commercial crew and um, our commercial partners um, with the commercial crew program that's making that more affordable to enable us to continue to start to look back to the moon as well. So we're we're in this sweet spot now in, in human spaceflight where we're able to uh, kind of get our hands in a lot of different cookie jars. Great. 
So we have our last question. So this is the perfect timing. Uh, have you ever had a chance to meet John Phillips, who was uh, our uh, 1987 graduate student, uh, two space, uh, uh, also astronaut, uh, two space shuttle mission, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I do remember that uh, John Phillips came to give a similar graduation talk, uh, a, a speech about three or four years ago. Um, okay, I, it sounds yeah. like I maybe just missed him. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that we've met yet, hopefully at some point in the future. Um, but I do, um, I do know um, Megan MacArthur is a, another NASA astronaut um, who's currently up on station. She's part of the <laughs> SpaceX crew too. And I saw when I was poking around on the website that she's actually going to give uh, a commencement speech from space, from station uh, <laughs> tomorrow for the, I think for the engineering department. So oh, uh, that's, awesome. that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so we've got, definitely have a few UCLA alum uh, spread out throughout the core. That's just amazing. Okay, so yeah. I think we want to conclude here. This is a really uh, good time. I want to yield the floor back to you. Um, uh, our, but uh, first, I'd like to thank Jessica for such a, a wonderful uh, speech and uh, Q&A session. I know she's extremely busy, um, uh, but, but we're just so lucky to get her here. Uh, uh, I want to yield the floor back to the chair, uh, Edwin uh, Schauble. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes, thanks, Jessica, and thanks, Ann, and thanks to everybody for asking such uh, really interesting questions. Um, so yeah, that that concludes the main program today. So what we're going to do now is, um, if you're if you've uh, stayed with us all the way through um, to uh, that wonderful conclusion, um, we're going to set up some breakout rooms so that if you want to sort of hook up with some of your friends and chat or uh, get shout outs from your uh, long lost uncle who's tuned in or whatever, um, you can uh, do that now um, and. Uh, with that, um, thank you very much for attending um, and uh, congratulations, congratulations again to all of our graduates and award winners. Um, you guys really, you made it work this year and that's an amazing achievement. <laughs>